like home. This is so amazing. What is it? The stuff that dreams are made of. You know how to get me fired up. I've got you. You've got me? Who's got you? Anybody else just get goosebumps? First of all, I would like to introduce my wonderful panelists, uh, Samar, Danny, and Imole. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, and I will let you guys say a little intro about yourselves. So if we can begin with Samar. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Samar Pollitt. I'm a VP of physical production at Warner Brothers. Um, I've been working in the industry, uh, well, I started off as a, as a PA about 20 something years ago, um, and I've worked for many years as a freelance assistant director, and then in production, and now in-house at Warner Brothers in production. I'm Danny. Hello, everybody. Um, I have worked in the industry for just over 10 years now, and I work as an assistant director, uh, mainly predominantly as a second now. Um, yeah. And Amole. Hi everyone, I'm Amole. Um, I'm a BFI alum. I did the BFI Academy a couple of years ago and recently I've just got done on a production too. Great, thanks guys. So we have a lovely uh, mixed group and range of experience across film and high-end TV. Uh, so I'm Jen and I work for Warner Brothers Discovery and we are celebrating our centenary, so 100 years of Warner Brothers. And we were very keen to be involved in the Future Film Festival because we want to make sure that you guys know the wonderful breadth of career opportunities there are in the screen sector. And for me personally, I had no idea that these things existed until I was in my mid thirties. So it is now my mission in life to make sure that none of you have to wait that long to know that these opportunities are out there um, and how you can try and access them yourselves. So in terms of the session today, we've kind of broken it up into three main sections. So first of all, we're gonna do a bit of general information and talk about roles. Um, so we're gonna use an example feature film and talk you through that. Uh, and then we're gonna move on to recruitment and the normal styles used so that you know what to expect. And then finally, we're gonna talk about how to stand out. So how to stand out at interview and also when you do get your first role, how can you try and make sure that that leads to your second? And then there'll be time for any questions that you have for the panel. Um, so if we can kick off, uh, Samar, maybe your best place to answer this. Can you give our audience an idea of just how many fabulous crew it takes to work on one of our big studio pictures, like a DC film, the lovely Wonder Woman in your background? <laughs> Yeah, so um, I guess the most recent film would probably be The Batman, which we made here last year. And I mean, on average, there's between about 2,000 to 3,000 people working on the film. Um, and that ranges from, you know, people working in construction to get the sets ready, special effects, hair and makeup, costume. There's a huge um, array of a part of departments on a movie like up to 40 45 departments so yeah so there's there's quite a lot of people that worked on a show uh of that size uh and maybe danny coming over to you can you give us a sense of how long would all those people be working on a show for so again if we're using something like the Batman, uh what would a normal Let's think of it in terms of prep. So the first kind of phase and then maybe the actual shoot principal photography and then post. Can you give us a vague idea what that might look like in terms of weeks? Um, yes. So, I mean, I'm not so clued up on production side of things, how long they take. Like, but generally, like people will go into pre-production in terms of like art department production will be there for like anywhere between nine months to a year before the actual shoot date to get pull everything together and get it ready um 
And then a shoot of that size usually lasts between 18 and 24 weeks, um, which, um, are, and then after that, you'll have a post period, which can be anywhere from like a year to two years, depending on the film and how much visual, visual effects and post works involved, if there's reshoots. Um, so yeah, a really, really long time. <laughs> So uh, I hope you can get an indication from that. These are large scale uh, projects. Um, and I suppose an indication, if we probably got about 200 people watching this session live, that is nowhere near enough to make one of these, one of these big films. Uh, we'd be needing sort of 10 times that many. Um, and I think for me, this definitely came as a big surprise. Uh, and compared to your standard sort of independent film that the BFI or BBC Films might support, you're talking about a far, far smaller crew base, uh, smaller budgets, shorter kind of shoot periods. So maybe a crew of 40 or 50, again, compared to a thousand plus. Um, so we have been doing some homework. Uh, and we are going to give you a brief run through just some of the departments that are covered. And we did a quick tot up and we came up with 28. There's probably more that are missing. Um, but if we start with maybe Danny, can we talk about your department? Yes. Um, so we are we work as assistant directors um, and essentially it's not a director's assistant, which a lot of people sometimes think it is. Uh, the best way I always describe it is it's kind of like the logistics behind directing. So we are in charge of we get like the first will get the script and they break it down. They'll make it into a schedule, which then gives us the basis of what we sort of run the film to to make sure we're running on track and also that we're shooting everything we need to shoot and in the script. And then when it comes to shooting, we are like the core like liaisons with all of the departments and we pull all the information together and make sure that everybody knows what we're shooting from day to day, what's required for that day. And then we also floor manage and run the set um, day to day, um, which also includes stuff with like the actors. So like they sort of report to us and we liaise with them, um, like getting into costume makeup, all that sort of, we run that from like what we call a unit base. Um, and it also works for extras. So um, anytime we have a crowd second that's sort of dedicated to working of getting crowd crowd and extras ready and again, bringing them to set. And then when they come to set, um, it falls on like the floor second and the crowd thirds and the thirds to direct those extras. So essentially when a director sits down, all they need to worry about is the actors and we've created the scene around them. Fantastic. And can you just give a brief overview of what do new entrant roles normally look like uh, in the AD department? So we call them PAs or like they're traditionally we're called runners, but generally we refer to them as PAs, now production assistants. Um, and we, on like a big film like Batman, you'd have, you have, you can have up to like 12 PAs in one day, if not more, because you'll need someone to help you get all the crowd ready. And that sometimes when you have crowd numbers of like 300, there'll be like eight of you in to help you liaise with all that sort of, like with, liaise with all those people. And then you also have um, lock off PAs, which that is like kind of the basic most entry level job and, what most people will have to do and it's kind of boring unfortunately and that will literally be okay we're turning over now we're rolling if you make sure that you broadcast that so people know and then also if you hear any noise run up and try and stop it or ask people nicely to be quiet and then you'll also have your set PAs which your set PAs work very closely with the third AD and floor second and first and they're um, a bit more involved in stuff like the liaising of cast and um, so a little bit closer to the set and keeping that nice and quiet and communicating with the crew. Great, thank you. Uh, and then let's move to somewhere completely different. So Imole, I think you shadowed in what I think was one of the most interesting roles recently. Can you talk to us a bit about script supervision? Um, so yeah, so recently I just got done on a production called The Lazarus Project. Um, I shadowed the script supervisor on there, which was really fun. But yeah, ultimately script supervising is just ensuring that the continuity of the scene and 
the integrity of the script is followed through. Um, as you've heard before, everybody has their own roles in the industry. Um, so it makes it quite hard for say the director or maybe the camera operator to um, pinpoint those issues of continuity. So that's why it's important to have someone else there that their sole job is to ensure the actors are picking up the cup when they're meant to pick the cup up and they're saying their lines correctly. Yeah. Great, thank you. Um, so we've talked about two kind of areas of new ancient roles that tend to be on set or close to set. Um, but Samar, let's talk about one of your uh, previous roles. Can you tell us a bit about the production office and what new entrant looks like there? Yeah, so in fact, the production office is, I would say is a very good place to start if you're, especially if you sort of, you know, if it's the first job in the industry, because it's often sort of like, it's kind of like the the engine of the of the film in a way. Um, the production office starts up as is one of the is the first office to start up usually, and um, and very similar to the assistant directors, they liaise with every department. So a typical sort of day in the life of a PA in the production office would be to open all the offices, you know, make sure that. Um, when the producer arrives or the director arrives that they have what they need and um you know sort of be on hand for uh you know doing any photocopying that he's doing or um you know they, they will be given sort of random tasks at any point from the assistant coordinators or maybe from the coordinator like doing the acado shop and you know it's essentially sort of helping that engine run. And sometimes um, you'll be delivering information between the office and other departments and sometimes sort of taking people from A to B. And, um, uh, you know, if a director wants to visit a department and doesn't know where they're going, usually the, the production office uh, PA would would help in, in, in doing that. So it's a very, very good place to have your eyes and ears open and to listen to all the conversations that are happening and try and get a sense of who's who and what they do and um, and get a sense of whether you feel that that environment is the right environment for you. Great. So, look, we are we are well underway. We've got three departments crewed up on our hypothetical feature film. We've got a long way to go, though. We're missing some key departments. Uh, accounts always overlooked but so important uh trying to make sure that everything's on budget uh that people are getting paid right petty cash payroll um i think new entrants maybe don't realize the value of starting an account and actually how many top execs for example someone that you work with at warner who came up that route um so don't discount it Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think in accounting, you, you know, a lot of these films are made for very tight budgets. And, um, and it's something that, you know, understanding how the money on a film is being spent, I think is, is invaluable to sort of making your own films or, you know, any any area of your career that you go go into from being a production designer or a costume designer etc it's very you know that th you still have to be very frugal with the resources that you have in order to make the best sort of you know to have the best um outcome so I think it's really yeah working in the accounts department is really is really helpful to see that uh, and then we can move on and rattle through because we need to crew up quickly. We're under pressure. Our production exec is, you know, getting anxious. Uh, so then we would have art department. Uh, we would maybe bring on construction as well. Wonderful costume, set decoration, uh, stunts team again, who would be on during prep, uh, transport, uh, video assist and then moving back again onto set uh, so camera lighting grips some other key ones we've missed out uh, casting one of my personal favorites would be there right at the beginning um, a really really interesting role 
I think we're trying not to define all of these departments for you because we would be here for three hours delivering a full on seminar. And I don't think any of you want that. But the aim of this is to try and open your minds to the fact that there is more than just one entrant role uh, on a production um, and to really try and do some research. There are some incredible podcasts, incredible YouTube resources out there. I highly recommend Team Deakins uh, by the very famous cinematographer Roger Deakins and his wife. They do uh, pretty long interviews with people in the industry across all of these different departments. So they'll give you a really great insight. Uh, and another favorite is Best Girl Grip by Nicole Davis. Uh, similar thing, uh, but focused on women in the industry. So have a listen. Um, and I think even if it's an area that you're not immediately drawn to, try and find out like, what are these people saying? What skills do you need? Because my biggest takeaway from when I discovered the world of film and high end TV existed in career terms is just that there really is a role for everyone. Whatever your passion is, whatever your natural kind of skill set is, whatever you're good at, your favorite subject at school, there will be a role that corresponds to it. You just might not know what that is yet. So do a bit of research, have a think about the environments in which you thrive. Is that you like to be standing up, you like to be moving around, you like to be outdoors, or actually you far prefer some structure and to be office-based. Um, and you owe it to yourselves to just do that research so you can try and figure out where you might fit. Um, panelists, any other departments you want to throw out there before we move on? I'm afraid I'm going to have missed some some favourites. Yeah, I mean, I think you make a really good point, though, Jen, in that the industry offers a huge skills base. You know, there are from caterers to people that work in special effects to people that you know we have costume dyers so we have people that literally deal with dyeing breaking down costumes like there are such a magnitude of different jobs so I would say a it's it's you know it's really beneficial to get in any any way you can to get some experience and then try and figure out where it is your heart really lies and you know understanding what you enjoy doing on a day-to-day -day basis and how that can fit into, um, you know, a career in film and TV. And I think added to that, actually, uh, one of the, maybe one of the only good things to come from COVID uh, is that probably not for much longer, but it was a department in itself on uh, all productions out of necessity. And it's offered some amazing opportunities uh, for new entrants to be on set and just to be there and watch everything. Uh, and again, learning so much. So I think every job, whether you're doing lock off, like Danny said, it may not seem like the most exciting role, but it's really important. And actually, if you do it wrong, that has big implications for the production. So everyone is part of this huge collaboration. And if you try and focus on doing those tasks, doing that role to the best of your ability, then hopefully further opportunities will open up. So we have got our big production. We've gone through our departments. We are crewing up uh, and we are now going to talk about recruitment uh, and what that looks like in the screen industries. Um, I think there's a there's a key difference between uh, lots of wonderful schemes and initiatives that are run in the sector. For example, BFI Film Academy, uh, Screen Skills Trainee Finder, and they follow more traditional kind of recruitment practices, CVs, cover letters, interview rounds, feedback. Uh, but in terms of production, and I think the pressures everyone are under, I think we can be honest and say, that's probably not how things are done when you are crewing up yourselves as a, as a lead on a department. Um, so Samar, do you wanna talk a bit to this of your experience when you were an AD and in production office of how that might work? Yeah, so I think, you know, I, I didn't know anybody in the industry and, you know, we were talking earlier and Danny said the same, 
we we had no contacts whatsoever and at the point that I entered there weren't any agencies or the BFI Film Academy or anything like that I think there's far more opportunity now in order to get in but um I was literally sort of posting my CV to anyone that would take it and uh and I eventually sort of I did a bit of work experience for free for a casting agency and sort of got in that way and ended up on a set and said oh my god I never want to leave here this is amazing um so you know there there are lots of ways now that you can enter um yeah I I've sort of lost track Jen have I have I answered that way <laughs> When you were reliving, reliving. I was, experience. like, passed me um, back so many years ago. Yeah, and how fantastic would it have been if there'd been a future film festival 20 yeah. years ago and you could absolutely. have found out all of this stuff. So absolutely. you guys are, are making absolutely the right first step of you are watching, watching this session, trying to learn as much as possible. Like, the knowledge is all out there. Um, but maybe, Imole, do you want to talk about... Um, experiences you've had because obviously you've gone through the BFI recruitment process but then I think you've also uh had some had some interviews with production as well so can you elaborate on that experience um so yeah so I think first of all it's very important to be yourself um just a word of advice out there because um ultimately although you feel as though you're in competition with other people it's so good to be able to stand out in a way um, and that is just literally by being yourself. Um, yeah, so the process of recruitment for me was a telephone call, but first I sent in my CV and a little a res um, resume in a way, um, a cover letter, that's the word I was looking for, a cover letter. Um, yeah, so I sent in a cover letter and a bit of my CV and I got a call back and the call came unexpectedly. I was outside shopping. <laughs> Um, so I had to tell the person, oh, would you mind calling me back in a couple hours time so I could um, sit down and be able to properly like uh, discuss with you my interest and my passion. And um, luckily they called me back and um, I was able to communicate with them and um, kind of express my passion and my interest and the set of skills that I had. And uh, I think that's what really resonated with them. Although I didn't start off as a um as a, someone that was really interested in the industry because I studied a law degree. Um, but with that law degree, I was trying to become something in a way that is like in the corporate side of things. So maybe help Warner Brothers with their copyright and trademark. Um, but ultimately I was like, no, that's too boring. Um, so I decided to have a bit more fun with onset work. So that's originally where it came from. Um, but yeah, so the film call was really good. Um, they really enjoyed my conversation. And then they emailed me back a couple of weeks later saying that I got the job, um, which was really exciting. And I can't remember if I fully answered your question. I'm so sorry. <laughs> it's fine. It's fine. No problem at all. I think the, the kind of biggest takeaways from that are uh, expect the unexpected. Uh, so the industry tends to work by somehow your CV will hopefully get put into the hands of somebody that is looking for a new entrance. Um, so tip number one, make sure that your CV is up to date. Uh, and if you are going for a particular department, please put the effort in and try and tailor that CV uh, so that it's relevant to that department. Don't have a CV all about how much you wanna be a makeup artist and expect to get a job in locations. Uh, because for that person reading your CV, they're really passionate about what they do and they want to work with other people who are really interested in that area. And so the least you can do is take five or 10 minutes to just tweak your CV and thinking about the, the intended audience. And that way you can be a step ahead of a lot of other people that won't take that time. Make sure that your contact details are front and center of your CV. And again, they're up to date. So have the right email address on there and have the right mobile number. Um, and again, if you know that your CV has gone somewhere, probably expect a call. And unfortunately, this is just the way it is. You're not going to know when it will happen. And like Imoli has said, if it's really, really inconvenient, you might just have to front up and say, 
is it possible for you to call me back in a couple of minutes or you know in half an hour when you're prepared mm -hmm. practice practice with friends and family if you find being on the phone like I do pretty mortifying like you just need to get over that like get used to it so you can try and develop a confident but authentic uh, kind of phone manner and again, think about what this person on the end of the phone, like Danny or Samar, wants to hear. Uh, they want to feel confident that you can do the job that they are offering. Mm -hmm. And again, the bit we've not mentioned is things tend to happen quite last minute in the world of production. Uh, and so it may very well be that you get a call saying, can you start in two days time? Uh, can you relocate? Uh, can you drive, which is still asked. It's a shame. There should be no expectation that everyone in the industry should be able to drive. But unfortunately, you will still get asked it a lot. If you are interested in learning to drive, please check out Screen Skills, who have bursaries uh, to support driving lessons. Um, so those are some of the key kind of things that you could expect to be asked in these telephone interviews. And I think the other thing we'd probably all like to flag is just, it's highly unlikely that you will hear back and say, we're really sorry, but the position's gone to someone else. Here's some feedback. Uh, most likely you may never hear anything at all. But I think if there's one message we can get through to everybody watching this today, it's please do not take that personally. Um, it's not it's not a good thing. I think we all probably wish the industry was different and that we had more time to be giving individual feedback, but it's likely what you're gonna come up against. So do not think this is the only opportunity I have to get my dream job. There's no dream job. There's no one opportunity. There's no rejection. It just means this one wasn't right for you and other doors will open. All four of us will have had these experiences, um, but I think it can feel quite isolating, particularly at the beginning when you're doing it yourself. Uh, so just try and be confident in your kind of self-worth and trust that other opportunities will be there. But that is not to say don't prep and try really, really hard and take the time to tweak your CV, et cetera, um, and be proactive in seeking out those opportunities. Um, guys, any other thoughts you had, particularly around kind of interviews and recruitment bits of advice? Um, yeah, I think it, sorry. No, go ahead, sorry. <laughs> um, I think it's, it's a really good insight to know that the nature of how films are made, there's a lot, you know, it's very ad hoc and people are, sort of come together for a very, very short time to create something. And it can be a very, very pressured environment. Um, I think it's important to understand before, before having a job in film and TV that, you know, the hours can be long and you can have bouts of time where you're on location, um, you know, away from your family and friends. And um, you know, there are, it, it is a sort of, it's a, it's a lifestyle choice as much as it is a career really. Um, and I think Danny can probably speak to that, you know, cause you're constantly working from show to show. So. Yes. Yeah. So with, with like, I, I move around a lot more and have sort of like over, you know, roughly like two, three, four jobs a year, rather than just being in one office all the time. And like I had one year, particularly a couple of years ago, where I was like doing a job in the Cotswolds and like I live in London. It wasn't like that bad. But then it was like, oh, now we're going to Greece and Serbia for the next three months. And then you come back and it's like, oh, you've been offered this next job away. And you're like, God, I just need to be home for just a moment because it, it can pull you left, right and center. Um, but yeah, I think. I think and drawing back to like what we said about going in for interviews and because you do just live in this like bubble and it's very like an absorbing bubble in it like you work really long hours and um with with your peers it's kind of like if you go into an interview you don't get the job like don't 
take that there could be so many reasons why you didn't get that job it's not necessarily that you did anything wrong could be that actually the way that the teams formed we need a boy rather than a girl to keep the balance or anything as simple as that could be what's made the difference of you not getting the job and I think that um going back to just being yourself and just try it as not, and I know the feeling like I remember my first interview and being so scared because I'd worked in like radio and tv and then when I got my film interview I was like oh my god I'm terrified but I was like just be yourself and just stay calm and ultimately it's sort of what I say to other people as well because it is a high pressure environment like Sam said and it's like if you are like stressed out in like a little interview it's kind of not a little but you know what I mean the big interview <laughs> but if you're stressed out and you can't communicate and you've made got yourself into a bit of a muddle it's it, it's not going to tell me that you're like oh, okay that you're going to be able to deal with pressure and talking to high profile people and dealing with difficult situations on the set so it's just kind of like just to stay calm and just try and be yourself and come across yeah as well as you can uh -huh. and yeah. I think Sorry, Amola, you go. Go ahead. Okay, uh, sorry. Um, but yeah, I would definitely say preparation is key. And especially if it's your first time kind of joining the industry. And um, I think it's important to research as much as you can about that role. Um, as I said before, I was shadowing the script supervisor. So I've never done script supervising in my life. Um, the roles that you typically hear of are kind of camera operators, directors. So those are ones that are more readily available in finding information on. So re research is so important, so crucial, because in that way, when you're having these phone interviews, you're able to communicate with the other person in a way that they understand as well. So you can kind of get that bond going just from that phone call alone. Um, but yeah, preparation and research is so important. Like as soon as you send off that CV, kind of get yourself in preparation for that phone call and um, be optimistic when you send off that um, cover letter and CV and kind of just get yourself in the, in the zone ready to go. Um, so when that phone call comes along, you know exactly what you can say and the kind of answers you can give, as well as the kind of skills that you have, the soft skills that are transferable over into your department. So, yeah. yeah, and I think as well, it's uh, picking up on what Danny said of, you know, don't discount other areas. Film isn't the be all and end all, much as we would maybe like to think it is. Um, you can be learning hugely valuable skills in radio, as Danny said, that was her background uh, in unscripted, you know, at your local theatre, if you're kind of helping out there, like it's all transferable skills. Um, I love it when people say that they've worked somewhere like McDonald's or, you know, in, in hospitality, because it means I have solid evidence that you can uh, get to work on time. You can maybe work on sociable hours. You're used to being on your feet in quite a high pressure environment. You're used to dealing with members of the public. Like that is a fantastic way. And again, if you're on a phone interview that you can say, like, I have all these skills. I may not have stepped onto a, a film set before, but. I've used the skill set in a different environment and it's transferable. So don't suddenly feel, oh, you know, I, I, I'm not experienced enough. Like you will have transferable skills. Yeah. Um, I completely agree with that. Whenever someone says I've got like, what do you look for in like totally non-experienced CVs? It's like any, any customer facing jobs or where you've had to deal with people, that's essentially what we do all day, every day. So that is so transferable, like you said, Jen. Here we are. The director of a feature is no different to your average customer in McDonald's. That's the, that's the <laughs> biggest takeaway. Equally challenging. Um, so final section before we open the floodgates to hopefully lots of questions from the audience. Um, can we talk a bit about tips? So once you are through the door, maybe first day, first week, how to stand out for all the right reasons? Any thoughts on this, Samar? Maybe let's start with you. Yeah, um, I'm going to totally steal this from, from you, Danny. But I think what's really important is that, you know, it's not a competition. And many times when you're working in departments, your peers are the people that are going to be getting you jobs just as much as it is the people above you. So it's not about a sort of, you know, competing against others to get the next work. It's about 
forming bonds and relationships with everybody and treating everybody the same. And I think that's a huge takeaway from certainly, you know, when I, when I was, you know, an assistant director, a lot of the friends that, that I have now are people that I met 20 years ago when we were all on set together as PAs. Um, And so, you know, that, that was really invaluable to me. Um, Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I would say it's so important to keep your ears to the ground on your first day on set. It's, it's about learning about the people that are go- you're going to be working with for quite a long time. So it's, it's, good, it's a good idea to be able to get to know them and be able to know what their, their likes are, their dislikes are, um, how they communicate. Some people are a lot more open with their dialogue, whereas others are kind of just like yes, no kind of response, the responses that you might get from them. So I think as a new entrant, um, walking on set on your first day it's good to kind of be open-minded learn as much as you can even if it's a completely different department to what you're there for um I think it's so important to learn about the different roles because you never know you walking on set on that day and thinking I don't know you want to become a camera trainee uh, you might turn around and see there's another department that kind of piques your interest maybe the art department is doing something that you never realized they did before Um, so it's really important to just keep an open mind try and be friendly and open to everyone I know it can be quite daunting because it's like oh where did all these people come from why is there so many people here Um, but yeah try and be as open as you can try and be as friendly as you can and make as many contacts and and connections because they will definitely help you later on in the future yeah, right. but Danny, I know some are stole yours. <laughs> so you have time to think of another. <laughs> no, it's okay. It's um, I mean, I just always find, particularly talking from like an AD's perspective, and it works to be honest, in all trainee levels, like on set, is that like really just on your first day on set, just try and absorb everything. Just keep your ears open. You're going to have a radio on. So many people aren't used to wearing a radio, but particularly when you're an AD, it's like, well, like it's literally the main point of contact because we can't see each other. Like we, we, we have to communicate through our radios. And it's like, if you're only listening for your name, you're going to miss so much information. And even if it's just the first and the, the third or the first and the second talking, all that information is going to be valuable for you in the whole workings of the day. So it's just trying not to be too overwhelmed. And also there's times where, oh, guys, is anybody near? Can somebody grab a tea for this person? And it's like, sometimes you don't hear like, you you can be like yeah I can go and do that I'm available I'm not doing anything and if you're kind of like aware of everything that's going on around you you're going to absorb a lot more and take a lot more away from the day yeah I think what's what's really impressive is when you can see that people you know the person at entry level is really doing their best and really putting their heart and soul into their job no matter what that is or what those tasks may be or how easy those tasks may be that you're just giving it your all and I think that goes a long long way you know knowing that somebody's doing the job because they want to be there not because they have to be there you know sure and just uh, just what you said someone about being wanting to be there I find get off your phones it's it's really it's really really bad at the moment of young people coming up and like I walk around the corner whatever they're doing and everyone's just down looking on their phones and if you're on your phone and you're looking on whatever you're looking at you're not absorbing what's happening around you and you're not listening um and that is yeah that's one of my main bugbears to be honest a lot of a lot of times now like sets will ask ask you to to leave your phones in the office and not take it to set and stuff there's you know confidentiality is really yeah I mean on Barbie I just worked on Barbie last year and Greta had a no no phone policy on set so even people like in the thick of it none of us had our phones and actually at first I found it like oh god because we used to communicate like oh the cast are traveling and I found it quite jarring at first and literally after a week I was like this is amazing because everyone's not sitting around looking at their phones it's like everyone's so much more engaged and yeah I loved it It's, it's yeah Great. I think I have one massive one, which is the importance of good timekeeping. Mm. I cannot stress it enough. If you're on time, you're late. 
Mm -hmm. um, and so it's the same as when with interviews, like you need to prep. Um, if you are uncertain about something, make sure you do a rehearsal of your journey to the studio, for example, uh, before your first day that you've thought about all those things, you know, when there's going to be a train strike or a tube strike, like you've thought about it in advance, because again, you are there to help your team and your department. Um, and if you can't get there on time, that, that does not send uh, a good message. Uh, and we want to make the best impression possible. Um, but I think also a more fundamental one is just remembering that, you know, our, our film of kind of 2000 people, which is gonna be a, a box office smash, it's really expensive to make. So every single minute that goes by is costing a terrifying amount of money that our accounts guys and people like Samar as a production exec are really, really aware of. And so if somebody is asking you to do something, there is probably an expectation that they want you to do it right away. Not that you will have lunch first, maybe have a chat with some other crew members. So I think if somebody is giving you an instruction, my instinct, and Danny, correct me if I'm wrong, is they probably want you to do it now. If you're not sure, maybe just double check with them as to... Right. Yeah, I mean, a lot of the time, everything, particularly on set and the running of the day is pretty instantaneous. The like what, what you need to happen and it needs you need to sort of know that it's happening and communicate that you're doing it. So, uh, yeah, it's it's not a, like, a, oh, yeah, OK, I'm I'll just make a tea first and go off and do it. It's kind of like. Time is money. Time <laughs> is money. Uh, yeah, that's the one of the biggest takeaways. Um, but I think particularly about that peer support, which is so integral, particularly when you're starting out in an industry like this, that some hours has touched on it. You know, it's it's long hours. You're maybe away from your normal kind of friends and family. Like you need people who are going to be there, like a nice support network that understand kind of what what you're going through, maybe in a way other people can't. And you're making a great first step because you're here. You're on day one of Future Film Festival. Um, there's going to be other things online, other stuff in venue, chances for you to all meet each other and connect. So do try and do that. I will confess, I find networking the most excruciating thing in the world. But let's not call it networking. Let's just call it connecting with other people with whom we have a shared passion. And then it feels less intimidating but hopefully you will rise up together and see each other through good and bad times. So please do make the most of this fantastic four day event uh, because I wish something like this had been around when I was younger. Um, but we have got an awful lot of questions. Uh, so we are gonna get into them now. So firstly, something we've not mentioned to date uh, how much of a benefit is a university degree if you want to work in the film industry? Who'd like to take that one? It's it's very interesting. Uh, so I would say for the majority of roles in film that it's not important at all. And I know plenty of people that work in the film industry and uh, of a very high caliber and do very high caliber, you know, very sort of big projects and they haven't had any formal education and that I think is you know can be sometimes sort of quite alarming to people but you know a lot of working in film I think is about getting first-hand experience there is nothing better than doing it so really I would you know I don't I I, I went to university I loved university and you know, and I felt probably for me, like it was better that I joined in my early twenties than, than, than being sort of 17. Um, but it is absolutely not the be all and end all. And you absolutely do not need to have a degree for the majority of positions in film, especially at entry level. I was asked once in my entire career, whether I had a degree. <laughs> so yeah. yeah, I feel like there's no set answer to this. It really needs yeah. to be a personal decision. Absolutely. Um, 
And all I would stress is that if you do go to university, make the absolute most of it. Uh, so make sure that you are filling your time with kind of extracurricular things, just like we've spoken about, that you can add on to your CV and show these skills of uh, dealing with members of the public. Uh, maybe you have joined a drama society and put on a show and you're going to take it to Edinburgh Finch. Um, or you're just doing a part time job to help support your studies. Again, all of them have really valuable uh, transferable skills, uh, which leads neatly into our next question. Uh, what skills from other industries and roles, so events, law, retail, hospitality, would you say are most applicable to film and TV roles? How do we highlight our transferable skills? Imole, do you want to touch on that? What, how have you found your law degree helpful? Um, well, law allowed me to kind of learn how to better communicate, uh, get my point across, and also be a lot more organised and to think logically, um, which were skills that I felt works really well with a script supervising role. Um, but to be honest, those skills can work for literally any role in any department. Um, Organisation is very important. As you said, turning off on time is turning up late. Um, so it's best to be as organised as you can to get there before um, call time to at least help settle yourself in, especially if it's your first day on set. Um, and communication is so important. As Danny said, with even the AD department, they can't see each other. So it's important to be able to get that point across very succinctly and clearly so that everybody understands what you're saying instead of taking up so much time trying to explain something um, that literally could have took like a minute to get across. Um, so, yeah, there's so many different transfer transferable skills that you can get from any degree um, that you can put across into your applications for any department really I mean quite a few of the skills that you need are literally soft skills so it's not necessarily a, a practical thing that you need to learn at uni or any other kind of course but it's more so how do you communicate how do you organize um, how do you think is just all of these kind of soft skills that you ultimately need yeah yeah, and I think I'd immediately think, oh, okay, if someone's done a law degree, they've probably got a pretty good attention to detail, they're used to reading documents, they might be really, really good in production office, where yeah. they be reviewing documents, making sure they're accurate. Again, something like script supervision feels quite a natural fit because it's that attention to detail. Um, I mean, it's across the board, but I think anything that shows, again, good timekeeping, organisational skills, have you had to be looking after your siblings whilst doing a university degree, whilst having a part time job? Again, that shows that you can multitask, you can prioritize um, anything that shows you can think on your feet, that you can have good presenting skills. I myself ended up uh, doing uh, teaching English as a foreign language qualification. I didn't have any intention of teaching, but I thought, oh, hopefully this will be a really good thing that will show that I can present to future employers. Um, so I would say anything that you're doing, if you use a bit of imagination, there's a way to make it relevant to that thing that you're applying for. Um, there should be a lot of information online. Again, screen skills should have examples of this. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, the world's your oyster, really, in terms of this. Just getting through school should give you an awful lot of examples that, that you can use. Um, okay, interesting one. Do you recommend just emailing your CV to a variety of production companies or should this be a tailored approach? Hmm. I guess I've had some friends that have done it that way and it's worked out for them, um, but it's not the one rule of kind of getting yourself out there. I mean, as you mentioned before, Screen Skills is a really good resource um, in just getting connections and finding ways to get into the industry. I mean, they have like a trainee finder thing, which um, allows people to get into the industry in that way. Um, so it's not necessarily something you have to do, but if you feel like it's something that you would like to do, um, I would say try and be persistent with it and ensure that your CV and 
your um, cover letter is up to date and to be respectful when you're when you're emailing them is very important you don't want to go and offend someone that you don't really know yet especially when you're trying to get in um so yeah, yeah. I would say it's a balance of the two wherever one favors you the most do that I agree, Amole. I think I would just say uh, we're going to run through these quite quickly because we've got limited time and lots of questions coming through. Um, so it's the equivalent of cold calling. Um, I think it's back to our, our kind of interview prep. You need to have an idea in your head of somebody that's going to be opening that email. If you can reference a couple of productions that that production company have been working on, that immediately is going to make you stand out from those people that didn't take five minutes to do a quick Google search. Um, so they are probably going to think better of you for doing that. Um, I would also say I've been given a few examples of people that have ended up working on production because they've hand delivered uh, their CV to the studio. Uh, so they've made the effort to come out to the studio um or they've tried to speak to people on their way into the studio I'm not sure I'd necessarily recommend that but you can see they've put in kind of additional effort there so just think about it like you need to show that you really want this um and anything that can show you putting in a bit more effort than the majority I think is a is a really positive thing so after you finish one job in production is it guaranteed that you get another or will you need to apply for another one how do I maintain those relationships? Danny, do you want to answer? Yeah, that? so no, it's definitely not guaranteed. And particularly when you start out, it's like quite scary because obviously you don't know so many people. So you might get your first job and think, great, this is it, I've done it. And then all of a sudden, the people that we're working with are going away for the next three months in a job and they can't bring their trainees or PAs with them. And you're like, oh no, I don't know anyone again. Um, and so it is like the more the more that you work the more people you'll get to know and this is where it comes back to what we said about the peer thing because it's like they you know a, another PA might get a text saying are you available for work that week and then they'll go no I'm not but I know someone that somebody that is so communicating and making friends with your peers is like really important to be able to go from job to job to job um but yeah you shouldn't for sure when you're first starting out like when I first started out I think I had one period of like three months where I didn't work and I was like oh my god I'm rubbish I'm never gonna work again and it's just like it just didn't fall into place and it was a quiet patch in the industry and for, for whatever reason but it, it 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 yeah it is very much like a kind of a train and sometimes also what happens is because you'll finish a long job and then someone will go, I need a, a PA or a trainee for this next job. And it's kind of like, oh, God, I did want a little bit of time off. But if I don't get on the train now, I'm going to miss that opportunity. And then I'm going to be like, it's, so it is a little bit of like almost like a game of Tetris to start with, because you're constantly like trying to fit it together. And it is very much freelance work. And so sometimes you're, you have to work a bit more than you want. And sometimes you work a bit less than you than you need. And I suppose, again, just to emphasize most of the roles that we've been talking about, like they are freelance roles um, and, uh, you know, that can be quite scary. It's 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 a fact about this industry and it's good to be aware of it at the outset. And I think just don't be complacent. So don't think you've got that one job and you're set for life. This is why we're talking about how can you stand out in a really positive way? How can you be trying to make good relationships with other kind of crew members? Uh, and again, that peer network, because it might be somebody who's been offered a job that they can't do, but they could recommend you. Um, so again, you're not in competition. A uh, very quick one, Samar, what's the key difference between an AD and a production manager? Oh, um, well, a production manager oversees the budget and makes sure that departments are working to their budgets. And um, and an AD, as Danny said earlier, they sort of, you know, are the people that help to logistically kind of bring the director's vision to life. So I would say the key difference is that one is more numbers um, and the other is more logistics. Great. Danny, any other comments on that one? 
just as I guess as well, like the AD is very much on set, whereas the production manager is more office based. They do always come like down to set and they're very involved with everybody as well. And saying good morning. Most most production managers I know will come down in the morning and probably after lunch to check in how the day is going. Um, but you are predominantly office based uh, being a production manager. OK, so we have so many questions and I am so sorry to everyone watching that we've not got time to go through them all. Um, just a couple of other things I wanted to flag, particularly in terms of building your network. Um, check out things like BAFTA Guru. They have a lot of online masterclasses there and different events. They do uh, weekends twice a year, uh, one in the nations, so I think Wales and Scotland, uh, and one England-based. Obviously the BFI, Screen Skills, a couple of podcasts I've already mentioned, but there's also women in film and TV uh, that do a lot of, of kind of networking stuff. So I think the headline is there is so much information out there and please don't let it stop you. If you think I don't live in London, I don't live near a big film studio, this rules out, this is a career option to me. Uh, there is more and more stuff happening around the country and there is so much available online. And we've just talked about transferable skills, you know, any any type of job that you can get in any industry it is still going to be relevant in some way to pursuing a career in screen. You've just got to use that bit of creativity uh, in tailoring it. Um, any other last words from our panelists? Words of wisdom you'd like people to take away? <laughs> I would say, what, what's the best <laughs> advice you've been given? Let's finish up with that. What's the best piece of advice? Yeah, I think I always just think um, be nice to people because actually you spend such a long time, like 12 to 14 hours a day. And it's like if you're not if you make that like a hostile environment, you're going to have a really horrible time. So not just people that you want to impress or just just like you know we very you do very much become like a little community whilst you're working so just treat everybody with respect and be nice and everyone's just trying to do a job and yeah just um be respectful and nice I think is just the main thing I always feel is important to know great uh, oh. <laughs> sorry um yeah I would say um echoing what Danny has said but also just being yourself is so important. I know it could be really hard because you're trying to impress everyone. You're trying to fit in in a way. But sometimes just being yourself and being different from everyone else around you is what kind of shows your star power in a sense. So let your sun and your star shine no matter where you are and just keep going. You'll definitely get there at some point. It took me a while, but I managed to get my own um, feet into the production side of things so definitely just keep going and just let your star shine Summer yeah I would say also uh, just adding to that is to be persistent and don't think that anybody's careers in this industry go like this and are a complete sort of um, you know in that kind of trajectory they're always ups ups and downs and there are times when you might feel like oh my goodness you know I'm not getting any calls or but be persistent keep going you know all all of this I think is you know advice that I that that is really invaluable be on time be nice and be persistent uh, and I will wrap up with uh words I try desperately to live by but some days it's easier than others which is comparison is the thief of joy um we're talking about building peer relationships uh but at the same time everyone's careers are completely unique uh you've got your own skills you've got your own journey to go on it can be so hard not to beat yourself up uh, when you see that your friends have maybe got a job that, that you were desperate for, or you think somebody else is doing really well and you're never going to get there. As Samar said, career trajectories do not go upwards in a straight line. They have huge ups and downs. It's just normally you only uh, get to see or hear and very heavily edited highlights reel. 
Um, so try really hard not to compare yourselves to others um, because you will get there eventually, but you'll get there your own way. Um, and thank you so much for joining us. Thanks to my panelists, Amole, Danny, Samar. I know you've got really, really busy schedules. So thank you for joining us. Um, and for everyone watching, thank you for taking time out. And I hope you found it valuable. Enjoy the rest of the festival.